You may be seated. As we were singing that song, I was reminded of my um, five-year-old uh, back in the day a little while ago. Uh, she started yelling from another room, Daddy, Daddy, I need you. So I, I heard that panic, and I started running as fast as I could to find out what she needed. And there she was sitting in the bathroom uh, needing some help. I kind of think about that as we were singing that song. I was kind of thinking that same thing with God the Father because how often do I yell, Daddy, Daddy, I need you, thinking of God my Father. And he's right there with us, isn't he? No matter what the situation, how silly we may think it is or how silly he may think it is, it's so important that we are able to run to God the Father. Happy Father's Day. I'm so glad that you are here. If you're joining us online, thanks for being there online. I'm glad that you are there. Hey, if you're um, here in the parking lot with us, right sitting over here is Dr. Horn and his wife and family. They're from Kenya. I'm so glad that you guys are here. So glad. Uh, they're going to be speaking here in just a couple weeks. You're going to be speaking uh, here at Journey, so I'm pretty excited about that. What is it, August? A couple weeks. Yeah, that's pretty close, yeah. So we're going to be speaking here in August. They're here for the summer for a couple while, and uh, I'm so excited. They're just amazing people to listen to. They have such good stories, and uh, it's fun to get to know them. So if you're sitting in the parking lot, come up and say hi to them. If you're online, come join us here in person one day, and you'll be able to meet people like the Horns, and it's really fun for them. So last week, we talked about these uncomfortable questions. We talked about what Jesus was doing and these uncomfortable questions that he asked. The last week, we, we heard him ask. The, the disciples were in the boat, and there was this storm that was coming. Coming. Jesus was asleep. The, the disciples looked at him and said, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to drown. We're about to die in this storm. Wake up. And Jesus looks at them and he says, why are you afraid? Do you still have little faith? Wow. That like hits you hard, doesn't it? That, that, that question of do you still not have faith hits you hard. And so it made us uncomfortable last week. It, it made us uncomfortable with who Jesus is and what he has been doing and what this looks like. And then Jesus quiets the storm. It, it's silenced as soon as he tells it to be silenced. And the disciples say, who is this man? Another uncomfortable question as we learned about who Jesus was, fully man and fully God. This is, this is the characteristic of Jesus is God. And he's sitting there in our boat with us through these hard times and these hurtful times. Fully man, fully God, and he is the Savior of the world. And so if you have your Bibles today, we're going to turn to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to start with verse 27. We're going to see another question that Jesus asks. And we're going to see how with this question, it should make us feel uncomfortable. If you're sitting online and you don't know who Jesus is, or if you're sitting in this parking lot and you don't know who Jesus is, this question should make you uncomfortable as we learn it today. Let's read together. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say that I am? And so think about this. Jesus and, and his disciples, they're walking into this village. And Jesus simply stops the disciples and his friends and he says, who do people say that I am? And their response in Mark chapter 8 verse 28 tells us that they might still be confused. Or the people around who Jesus is, they, they might be confused. Mark chapter 8, 28. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other prophets. You see, here's what we have. The, the disciples in that boat, they were terrified, right? As soon as Jesus calmed the storms and it was silenced, they were terrified and they were saying, who is this man? And now when we're picking up just a couple chapters later, we're realizing that, that people still don't understand who Jesus is. They still don't understand what Jesus is all about. It's not clicking in their mind of who Jesus is. And I think about this today, and even some of us as Christ followers, as Christians, we still don't understand and realize who Jesus is. We, we still don't understand what Jesus is all about. And so we've taken God of the Bible, Jesus of the Bible, and we've put our own culture into this, and we started putting these two things together. And we're putting these false characteristics of Jesus. He's, my, he's a good guy. He's my BFF. As the scripture says, it says, he's just one of the other prophets. You see, we're, we're starting to put these false characteristics of who Jesus is. And today's culture, we're doing the same thing. We're, we're saying Jesus is just a good guy. He's the guy upstairs. We're putting these false characteristics on him. And so as people in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, they heard about this coming Messiah, this, this Savior that's coming into this world. They, they thought that Jesus was going to be this mighty warrior. 
He was going to be able to come in and, and defeat Rome and the soldiers and the armies. And he's going to be able to defeat Rome and he's going to set up this, this, this earthly kingdom here. And again, we see that they misunderstood who Jesus is. They didn't understand that Jesus was the savior of the world, but he was also God. And we realized that Jesus was not lining up with our expectations. Look what C.S. Lewis said about this. He said, you must make your, your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can't shut him up for a fool. You can't spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus is the Savior of the world, fully human and fully God. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And here's this question that should make us uncomfortable. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? As you're sitting in this parking lot or watching on, on the screen, let this, let this question make you feel uncomfortable for just a moment. Who do you say that Jesus is? People's responses, Peter's response was, you're the Messiah. Peter replied that, that you are Christ. You're, you're the anointed one. You're the one that will come and restore the Jewish people. You are the one that will come and, and destroy the, the, the armies of Rome. You are the one that will bring the kingdom of God to earth. You are the one that will fill the, pro, pro, the promises of the Old Testament. You are Jesus the Messiah. But again, they're putting their culture on this man by the name of Jesus. And they're hoping that he's going to be this mighty warrior that comes in. They're answering that question wrong. Who do you say that I am? Ask that question to yourself right now. Who do you say that Jesus is? Mark chapter 8, verse 30. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, wait a minute. I, I was confused by this. Why, why would Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, fully God, fully human, why would he tell the disciples, his best friends, not to tell anybody about what Jesus is or who Jesus is? And so as I started studying this a little bit more, it, it kind of clicked in my mind. The Jewish people understood and they heard about who Jesus was. Remember, in the Old Testament, they saw this, this biblical concept of the Messiah, they heard the prophecies that were, were told about this Jesus that was coming. And again, this Jesus didn't meet their cultural expectations. This Jesus, this friend that was sitting right there with them, asking that question, who do you say that I am? This Jesus that was sitting right there isn't meeting the cultural expectations of the Jewish people at this time, of the friends of this time. And they thought this Messiah was going to be a great warrior, and he wasn't. And they thought this, this Messiah was going to be a great warrior that was going to defeat the Roman armies. And he didn't. And they thought that this Messiah, he was going to rescue and save the world that they understood and knew. And he didn't. And they were confused. And they were left wondering. And they were doubting. And so what Jesus was doing, he's saying, listen. Don't announce me as that Messiah that you've put into this culture because that's not who I am. Don't announce that I am this great warrior because that's not what I've come to do. Jesus knows what's going to happen. Jesus is about to explain for the very first time about what is going to happen. So let's start looking at that. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. For the very first time, Jesus is explaining his mission of why he's come to earth. I, I can just picture him sitting with his disciples there. He just asked that, that very confusing question, who do you say that I am? He, he's reminding them of, of that boat where the storms were, and he said, silent storms, and the storms immediately stopped, and they started questioning, who is this man? And so here Jesus is, he's, he's sitting with these disciples, these friends, and he starts to bring other people around. I can, I can just imagine people are crowding around Jesus to find out what's taking place. And Jesus said, I'm going to be rejected. 
I'm going to be killed this brutal death. I don't deserve it, but I'm going to do it anyways for the people around me, for the entire world. I'm going to stay dead for just a little while, and then I'm going to come back to life. You'll see this happen, disciples. You'll see this happen, friends. And in that moment, they're uncomfortable. And in that moment, that question just keeps going through their mind. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that I am? Am I your Savior? Am I your God? Mark chapter 8, verse 32. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. This is an amazing, uh, important spiritual leadership moment. Because Peter took Jesus aside. He didn't do it right there in public. He didn't do it right there in front of everybody. He took Jesus aside and he started questioning Jesus. Wait, no, 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 stop it, Jesus. Wait, you're the Messiah. I, I understand that you are the Savior. How dare you say these things that you're going to be put to death? Stop it. You're not meeting my expectations, Jesus. And I can just see Peter and Jesus having this another awkward moment where Jesus is probably just simply standing there, kind of maybe shaking his head. Who do you say that I am? Peter, who do you say that I am? Church, who do you say that I am? World, who do you say that I am? Mark chapter 8, verse 33, Jesus turned around and he looked at his disciples. He was catching their attention. Look at, look at what I'm about to teach, Peter. Then Jesus reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. These are strong words that Jesus is saying. Jesus is putting Peter in his place at this very moment. He, he's not saying, Peter, you're Satan. Don't hear that wrong. He, he's not saying, Peter, you're demon-possessed. Don't hear that wrong. What, what he's saying is, Peter, you're unknowingly talking for Satan right now. You're unknowingly saying the things of the world right now. Listen. You're looking at this human point of view rather than God's point of view, Peter. Who do you say that I am? This is the reason I think as Christ followers, as your pastor, and as we sit here in this parking lot and, and watch online, as the body of Christ, this is the reason why I believe that we must have a strong biblical worldview. Because when we take the Bible and we start putting in the context of the American culture, we're going to be just like Peter and we're going to say, I don't understand. Jesus, what are you doing? God, what are you doing? Why are you doing the things you're doing? It's because we're trying to put the, the scriptures, God word, the inerrant word of God into our American culture and we're trying to take those scriptures and put it into our, our place. And it's not working for Peter and it's not working for us. We have to understand the Bible and we have to know it and we have to understand the history and the culture and the context of why and who it was written to and understand that it can apply to us today. This is exactly what is happening to Peter. He's trying to force this, this thought process into his own thought processes. He's trying to, to force the Old Testament prophecies into his culture today. And he's saying, these are my desires. These are my expectations of who you are, Jesus. And you're not meeting them. Stop. So let's just recap here real quick as those couple verses. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? This should cause us as Christ followers and as non-Christ followers, it should cause us to stop and to think about that answer. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah. But in my worldly expectations of what I thought you should be, you're not meeting them. You're not meeting Jesus. Jesus, you're not meeting the desires of my heart. And Jesus responded with, you see, I'm going to be rejected. I will be. I must be rejected because that's what the Old Testament says. I will be. I, I must be killed. I, I will be. I, I must rise from the dead. And Jesus is talking about these things with the crowds that are starting to gather around him. And I think to myself, why is this important? Why do we care as Journey Ministries or the body of Christ today? Why do we care as non-Christians or people that are doubting or questioning who Jesus really is? I, I think this is important because of two things. One, it points us back to the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecy of the Old Testament. And if Jesus and God did exactly what he said he would do there, he's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do here. 
God is faithful. He will follow through with what he says he's going to do. I also believe this is important for us today is because this is the gospel. As we read through the book of Mark, this section right here is like the key section. This is the gospel, the good news for the entire world. This right here is telling us how Jesus Christ is planning to purchase my salvation with his shedding of his blood. How Jesus' death and resurrection was for me and it was for you. And this helps us to identify with Jesus as he's leading himself to the cross. This helps Jesus understand and look at me as he took those sins upon himself. And he's saying, here I am. Here I am. And who do you say that I am? Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is the rock that I stand on. And as fully man and as fully God, I understand a better idea of Jesus. Because of that question, who do you say that I am? Look what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. He said, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in time past. That, that word shedding of the blood right there, this is a sacrifice for our sins. The people, the Jewish people, the, the disciples, the people of that time, they understood the Old Testament. And for the sins, there was always shedding of the blood. And here Jesus is saying, or here Paul is saying about Jesus, that there will be this shedding of blood. This is a payment for our forgiveness. This is salvation. Romans chapter 3, verse 26. Let's continue. For he was looking ahead, including them, in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in the sight when they believe in Jesus. I am made right in God's sight because of my belief and my faith in Jesus Christ. Who do you say that Jesus is? He is my Savior, He is my God. He is the one that has washed me free from my sins so that I can be holy and I can be forgiven. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of good news, you will save it. Verse 36, and what, and what do you want benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message is these adulterous and full, sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Listen. Listen to me closely. If you're watching online, listen. Listen. If you say that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, if you believe that Jesus was rejected, he was killed, and he will come back to life, and he will come back to prepare a place for us, if you're saying to Jesus, I choose to follow you, he's saying you have to put it into action. He's saying you have to turn from your sinful ways. You are a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. You have to turn from your sinful ways, your selfish ways, and you have to put into actions and you have to follow his commands. And what does that look like for us today? It means simply we're picking up our cross and we're following Jesus. It means we're we're going to be obedient even if it makes us uncomfortable. It's saying we're going to be obedient even if our friends around us aren't going to be obedient. It's saying as Journey Ministries, the body of Christ right here in Davison and the surrounding communities around us, that we will be the body of Christ that goes out and serves our neighborhoods. We will go out and talk with our neighbors. We will go out and we will be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ today as the body of Christ. Because we are going to be obedient to God's word And we're going to follow it, and we're going to study it, and we're going to understand it, and we're going to know it, and we're going to preach it out loud in actions from inside of us. And we will pick up our cross, and we will follow him. 
Listen to me closely. The time is now for you online, for us sitting in this parking lot. The time is now for you to answer that question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? Are you willing to live an obedient life for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to live an obedient life because of what Jesus Christ has done for you? Next Sunday, we're going to have our family celebration over at Lake Callis. And in those moments, we're going to be able to hear our VBS kids, our Vacation Bible School kids. We're going to hear them sing, and we're going to dance, and it's going to be an amazing family celebration there. We're going to hear powerful testimonies of people that are, are being baptized, saying, yes, I am fully obedient to God. I'm picking up my cross, and I will be uncomfortable, and I will be dipped into water in front of everybody because that's what Jesus has asked me to do in obedience. I'm going to show my testimony of, of being dunked in the water, being shown that I am dead to self, and as I come back up out of that water, I am live in Christ Jesus. The old is gone and the new is here. We're going to see those that are going to be baptized. And I know that there are some people sitting in this parking lot or maybe even watching online. And you said you've been a Christ follower for a long, long time. But you're not living in obedience. You're not answering the question truly of who do you say that I am. Are you the Messiah? Yes. Are you fully God? Yes. And I will pick up my cross and I will follow you. And so let me challenge you today, church. If you don't understand who Jesus Christ is, if you don't answer that question, who do you say that I am? If you've never answered that question, will you come find me and talk to me today? If you're online, simply put in the comments that you want to talk to somebody. And, and Chris is here online with us today. He'll be able to answer questions, pray with you. If you want to be baptized, you can get your information to me. I believe this is so important for us, church. If you call yourself a Christ follower, it's so important for us to pick up our cross and to be uncomfortable and follow him. If you want to be baptized this week, right after church today, we're going we're gonna to have a, a little baptism meeting. I can try to answer your questions. We have some pamphlets for you to fill out and to look at. If you're online, just let me know this week that you want to be baptized Sunday. It's so important for us to understand as a Jesus follower that I will follow him with everything that I have and I will turn from my selfish ways and I will pick up my cross and I will follow him with everything that I have. Next Sunday, we're going to be showing our testimony. We're going to be showing the world around us why we are Christ followers and why we have answered that question of, Jesus, you are the Messiah and you are God. Let's pray. God, again, I just thank you for who you are. God, I'm so thankful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to this world. And Lord, there's many of us that are asking that question, who are you, Jesus? Some of us are living in doubts and insecurities. Some of us have never even been asked that question of who you are, Jesus. Today might have been the first time they've ever heard that. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking you today to speak to each individual, whether they are in this parking lot or watching online. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to them and encourage them and help answer that question of who Jesus is. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to give courage if people have not truly picked up their cross and have uncomfortably followed you, they've laid themselves aside, they've put away their selfish desires. Lord, give us courage to follow you. Lord, give us courage to walk into our neighborhoods, to walk into the towns that we live in, and to form community there holding each other accountable, studying your word and applying it to our lives. God, if there's someone that is hearing this message today and they have not followed you and put their faith and their trust and belief in you, God, give them the courage to speak to myself or another pastor 
or someone that they understand and know that is a Christ follower. God, if we have said yes to you, and those people are sitting here or watching online, if those people that have said yes to you, help them to live in obedience. To take your word and to keep it in context. Not skewing it for our own desires or our own expectations. But fully living alive. Because we understand and know the God of the Bible and Jesus, your son. God, help us to have a good testimony. To be proud of who we are as we find ourselves living with you, Jesus. Remove the old and bring a heart of life. And help us to live in lavish worship, intentional community, faithful service, and effective outreach. I love you, Jesus. I'm so thankful for what you have done for me. Help us to live holy and forgiven. It's your name I pray. Amen. Will you stand with us and sing this final song, please?